Chapter 5. The Toil of Trace and Trail Thirty days from the time they left Dawson, Buck and his mates arrived at Skagway. They were in a wretched state, worn out and worn down. Buck's 140 pounds had dwindled to 115. Pike, who often faked injuries to get out of working hard, was now limping in earnest. Solex was limping, and Dub was suffering from a twisted shoulder blade. Their feet ached and fell heavily on the trail, jarring their bodies and doubling the fatigue of a day's travel. There was nothing wrong with them except that they were dead tired. It was not the dead tiredness that comes through brief and excessive effort and only requires a few hours of rest. It was the dead tiredness that comes through the slow and prolonged draining of strength from months of toil. There was no power of recuperation left, no leftover strength to call upon. It had been all used, the last least bit of it. Every muscle, every fiber, every cell was tired, dead tired. And there was reason for it. In less than five months, they had traveled 2,500 miles, during the last 1,800 of which they had had just five days rest. When they arrived at Skagway, they were on their last legs. They could barely keep the traces taut, and on the downward hills, they barely managed to keep out of the way of the sled. Mush on, poor sore feet, the driver encouraged them as they tottered down the main street of Skagway. This is the last. Then we get one long rest, eh, for sure, one bully long rest. The drivers expected a long stopover. They had covered 1,200 miles with two days rest themselves, and they believed they deserved a long rest. But so many men had rushed into the Klondike, men who had sweethearts, wives, and family back home, that the mail was piling up to huge proportions. Also, there were official orders. Fresh batches of Hudson Bay dogs were to take the places of those worthless for the trail. The worthless ones were to be sold. Three days passed, by which time Buck and his mates discovered how really tired and weak they were. On the morning of the fourth day, two men from the United States came along and bought them, harness and all, for a song. The men addressed each other as Hal and Charles. Charles was a middle-aged man with weak and watery eyes and a mustache that twisted up. Hal was a youngster of 19 or 20, with a big Colt revolver and a hunting knife strapped about him on a belt full of cartridges. This belt was the most noticeable thing about him, and it advertised his inexperience. Both men were definitely out of place, and no one could understand why they had decided to travel to the north. Buck heard the discussion, saw the money pass between the man and the government agent, and knew that the Scotch half-breed and the mail train drivers were passing out of his life, just like Perrault and Francois and the others who had gone before. When driven with his mates to the new owner's camp, Buck saw a slovenly sight. Tent half-stretched, dishes unwashed, everything in disorder. He also saw a woman. Mercedes, the men called her. She was Charles's wife and Hal's sister. Buck watched them apprehensively as they proceeded to take down the tent and load the sled. There was a great deal of effort in what they were doing, but very little organization. The tent was rolled into an awkward bundle three times as large as it should have been. The dishes were packed away unwashed. Mercedes continually got in the way and wouldn't stop trying to talk to the men and give them advice on the packing. When they put a sack of clothes on the front of the sled, she suggested it should go on the back. When they moved it to the back and covered it over with a couple of other bags, she discovered more items that needed to go in that very sack, and they unloaded it again. Three men from a neighboring tent came out and looked on, grinning and winking at one another. You got a right smart load as it is, said one of them, and it's not me should tell you your business, but I wouldn't tote that tent along if I was you. Undreamed of, cried Mercedes, throwing up her hands in dismay. However in the world could I manage without a tent? It's springtime. You won't get any more cold weather, the man replied. She shook her head, and Charles and Hal put the last odds and ends on top of the mountainous load. Think it'll ride? one of the men asked. Why shouldn't it? Charles demanded rather shortly. Oh, that's all right, that's all right, the man quickly added. I was just a wondering, that's all. It seemed a bit top heavy. Charles turned his back and pulled the straps down on the load as well as he could, which was not well at all. And of course, the dogs can hike along all day with that contraption behind them, added another of the men. 
Certainly, said Hal with freezing politeness, taking hold of the gee pole with one hand and swinging his whip with the other. Mush, he shouted. Mush on there. The dog sprang against the harness, strained hard for a few moments, then relaxed. They were unable to move the sled. The lazy brutes, I'll show them, he cried, preparing to lash out at them with the whip. But Mercedes interfered, crying, Oh, Hal, you mustn't, as she caught hold of the whip and wrenched it from him. The poor dears, now you must promise you won't be harsh with them for the rest of the trip, or I won't go a step. Precious lot you know about dogs, her brother sneered, and I wish you'd leave me alone. They're lazy, I tell you, and you've got to whip them to get anything out of them. That's their way. You ask anyone. Ask one of those men. Mercedes looked at the men imploringly. She couldn't stand the sight of pain in the dogs. They're weak as water, if you want to know, came the reply from one of the men. Plum tuckered out. That's what's the matter. They need a rest. Rest? They don't need rest, said Hal. Mercedes rushed to the defense of her brother. Never mind that man, she said. You're driving our dogs, and you do what you think best with them. Again, Hal's whip fell upon the dogs. They threw themselves against the harnesses, dug their feet into the packed snow, got down low to it, and put forth all their strength. The sled held as though it were an anchor. After two efforts, they stood still, panting. The whip was whistling savagely when once more Mercedes interfered. She dropped on her knees before Buck with tears in her eyes and put her arms around his neck. You poor, poor dears, she cried sympathetically. Why don't you pull hard? Then you wouldn't be whipped. Buck did not like her, but he was feeling too exhausted to resist her, taking it as part of the day's miserable work. One of the onlookers, who had stayed silent to prevent saying something mean, now spoke up. It's not that I care a whoop what becomes of you, but for the dog's sakes, I just want to tell you, you can help them a lot by breaking out that sled. The runners are froze fast. Throw your weight against the G-pole, right and left, and break it out. A third time, the attempt was made, but this time, following the advice, Hal broke out the runners which had been frozen to the snow. The overloaded and unwieldy sled inched ahead, Buck and his mates struggling under blows from the whip. A hundred yards ahead, the path turned and sloped steeply into the main street. It would have required an experienced man to keep the top-heavy sled upright, and Hal was not such a man. As they swung on the turn, the sled went over, spilling half its load into the street. The dogs never stopped. The lightened sled bounced on its side behind them. They were angry because of the poor treatment they had received. Buck was raging. He broke into a run, the team following his lead. Hal cried, Whoa! Whoa! But they paid no attention. He tripped and was pulled off his feet. The capsized sled rolled over him, and the dogs dashed up the main street of Skagway, scattering the remainder of the load along the way. Kind-hearted citizens caught the dogs and gathered up the scattered belongings. They also gave Hal, Charles, and Mercedes advice. If they ever wanted to reach Dawson, they needed to remove half the load on the sled and double the number of dogs to pull it. Hal and his sister and brother-in-law listened unwillingly, but they tried to lighten the load. Onlookers laughed as canned goods were removed from the sled. Canned goods on the trail were like a luxury. Blankets for a hotel, said one of the men who laughed and helped. Half as many is too much. Get rid of them. Throw away that tent and all those dishes. Who's going to wash them anyway? Good Lord, do you think you're traveling on a Pullman? And so it went. The elimination of superfluous equipment. Mercedes cried when her clothes bags were dumped on the ground and article after article was thrown out. She sat, wrapping her hands around her knees, rocking back and forth brokenheartedly. She stated she would not go an inch, not for anyone. She appealed to everybody and everything, but finally wiped her eyes and started to throw out everything, even clothing that was necessary. And in her zeal, when she had finished with her own, she attacked the belongings of her men and went through them like a tornado. Even with the sled load cut in half, it was still a formidable size. Charles and Hal went out in the evening and bought six outside dogs. These, added to the six of the original team, and Teak and Kuna, the huskies obtained on the record trip back from Dawson, brought the team up to fourteen. But the outside dogs... Though practically broken in since their landing, 
did not amount to much. Three were short-haired pointers, one was a Newfoundland, and the other two were mongrels of indeterminate breed. They did not seem to know anything, these newcomers. Buck and his mates looked upon them with disgust, and though he speedily taught them their places and what not to do, he could not teach them what to do. They did not take kindly to trace and trail. With the exception of the two mongrels, they were bewildered and spirit-broken by the strange, savage environment they found themselves in and by the poor treatment they had received. The two mongrels had no spirit at all. With the newcomers hopeless and forlorn, and the old team worn out by 2,500 miles of continuous trail, the outlook was anything but bright. The two men, however, were quite cheerful, and they were proud, too. They were traveling in style with 14 dogs. They had seen other sleds leave Dawson or returning, but never had they seen a sled with 14 dogs. And there was a reason why 14 dogs should not drag one sled, and that was that one sled could not carry the food of 14 dogs. But Charles and Hal did not know this. They believed they had worked the trip details out on paper, figuring out how many dogs they had and how much food each dog would need. Mercedes looked over their shoulders and nodded. It was all so very simple, or so they thought. Late the next morning, Buck led the long team up the street. There was nothing lively about it, no snap or spirit in him or his fellows. They were starting dead weary. Four times he had covered the distance between Skagway and Dawson, and the knowledge that he was facing the same tiring trail once more made him bitter. His heart was not in the work nor was the heart of any dog. The outside dogs were timid and frightened, and the inside dogs had no confidence in their masters. Buck knew he could not depend on these two men and the woman. They did not know how to do anything, and as the days went by, it became apparent that they could not learn. They were lazy about things, without order or discipline. It took them half the night to pitch a slovenly camp, and half the morning to break that camp and get the sled loaded so sloppily that for the rest of the day they were forced to keep stopping to rearrange the load. Some days they did not make ten miles. On other days they were unable to get started at all. And on no day did they succeed in making more than half the distance used by the men as a basis in their calculations for the dog's food. It was inevitable that they would run out of dog food. But they hastened it by overfeeding the dogs early in the trip. The outside dogs, whose digestions had not been trained to get the most out of little food, had voracious appetites. And when the worn-out huskies pulled weakly, Hal decided to double their ration. And to make things worse, Mercedes, feeling sorry for the state of the dogs, stole from the fish sacks and fed them secretly even more food. But it was not food that Buck and the huskies needed. It was rest. And in addition to making poor time, the heavy load they dragged sapped their strength severely. Then came the underfeeding. Hal awoke one day to the fact that his dog food was half gone and the distance only a quarter covered. Worse than that, there was no way to get any more food along the way. So he cut down all the rations and tried to increase the day's travel. His sister and brother-in-law supported him, but they were frustrated by their heavy load and their own incompetence. It was a simple matter to give the dogs less food, but it was impossible to make the dogs travel faster, and their own ability to get started earlier in the morning prevented them from traveling longer hours. Not only did they not know how to work the dogs, but they did not know how to work themselves. The first to die was Dub. Poor, blundering thief that he was, always getting caught and punished, he had still been a faithful worker. His twisted shoulder blade, untreated and unrested, went from bad to worse, until finally Hal shot him with the big Colt revolver. It was obvious that the outside dogs could not survive on the food ration of an experienced husky, so giving the outside dogs half the ration of a husky, as Hal decided to do, would guarantee their deaths. The Newfoundland went first followed by the three short-haired pointers, the two mongrels hanging more grittily on to life, but going in the end. By this time, all the amenities of the Southland had fallen away from the three people. Originally believing Arctic travel would be glamorous and romantic, the travelers soon became aware of the harsh reality of the situation. Mercedes stopped weeping over the dogs, being too occupied with weeping over herself and with quarreling with her husband and brother. <laughs> 
Fighting was one thing that they were never too tired to do. Their irritability arose out of their misery and increased with it. The wonderful patience of the trail, which comes to men who love the toil and the travel, did not come to these three. They had no inkling of such a patience. They were stiff and in pain. Their muscles ached, their bones ached, their very hearts ached. And because of this, they became angry, and harsh words were first on their lips in the morning and last on their lips at night. Charles and Hal fought whenever Mercedes gave them a chance. Each of the men believed that he did more than his fair share of the work, and would say so at every opportunity. Sometimes Mercedes sided with her husband, sometimes with her brother. The result was an unending family quarrel. Starting from a dispute about who should chop a few sticks for the fire, a dispute which concerned only Charles and Hal, suddenly would include references to the rest of the family, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, people thousands of miles away, and some of them dead. Why the actions or thoughts of any of these people matter to chopping sticks is beyond understanding. Still, the fights between the three always dragged on and turned into arguments about other irrelevant topics. In the meantime, the fire remained unbuilt, the camp half-pitched, and the dogs unfed. Mercedes nursed a special grievance, the grievance of being a lady. She was pretty and soft and had been treated chivalrously all her days. But the present treatment by her husband and brother was anything but chivalrous. It was her habit to act helpless, but the men complained and would not give her the special treatment she expected. Because of this, she made their lives unbearable. She no longer thought about the dogs, and because she was sore and tired, she demanded to ride on the sled. She was pretty and soft, but she weighed 120 pounds, a heavy last straw to the load dragged by the weak and starving animals. She rode for days until the dogs fell in the traces and the sled stood still. Charles and Hal begged her to get off and walk, pleaded with her, but she wept and called them brutal and cruel. On one occasion, they took her off the sled by force. They never did it again. She let her legs go limp like a spoiled child and sat down on the trail. They went on their way, but she did not move. After they had traveled three miles, they unloaded the sled, came back for her, lifted her, and put her on the sled again. They were so occupied with their own misery that they ignored the sufferings of their animals. Hal's theory was that one must get hardened, and he hammered it into the dogs with a club. At the Five Fingers, the dog food ran out, and a native there offered to trade them a few pounds of frozen horse hide for the Colt revolver on Hal's hip. The horse hide was a poor substitute for food. In its frozen state, it was more like strips of iron, and when a dog wrestled it into his stomach, it thawed into thin, leathery strings, irritating and indigestible, and lacking any nutrition. And through it all, Buck staggered along at the head of the team as if in a nightmare. He pulled when he could. When he could no longer pull, he fell down and remained down until blows from the whip or club drove him to his feet again. All the stiffness and gloss had gone out of his beautiful furry coat. The hair hung down, limp and draggled, or matted with dried blood where Hal's club had bruised him. His muscles had wasted away to knotty strings, and each rib and every bone in his frame were outlined cleanly through the loose hide that was wrinkled in folds of emptiness. It was heartbreaking, but Buck's heart was unbreakable. The man in the red sweater had proved that. It was the same way with the other dogs. They were walking skeletons. There were seven left altogether, including him. In their misery, they had become indifferent to the bite of the lash or the bruise of the club. The pain of the beating was dull and distant, just as the things their eyes saw and their ears heard seemed dull and distant. They were barely alive bags of bones in which sparks of life fluttered faintly. When a halt was made, they dropped down in the traces like dead dogs, and the spark dimmed and paled and seemed to go out. And when the club or whip fell upon them, the spark fluttered feebly up, and they struggled to their feet and staggered on. There came a day when Billy, the good-natured, fell and could not rise. Hal had traded off his revolver, so he took the axe and knocked Billy on the head as he lay in the traces, then cut the carcass out of the harness and dragged it to one side. Buck saw, and his mates saw, 
and they knew that this was very close to happening to them. On the next day, Kuna died, and only five of them remained. Joe, too close to death to be angry. Pike, crippled and limping, only half-conscious. Solex, the one-eyed, still faithful to the toil of trace and trail, and sad that he had so little strength with which to pull. Teak, who had not traveled so far that winter, and who was now beaten more than the others because he was fresher, and Buck, still at the head of the team, but no longer enforcing discipline or striving to enforce it, blind with weakness half the time, and keeping the trail by the dim feel of his feet. It was beautiful spring weather, but neither dogs nor humans were aware of it. Each day the sun rose earlier and set later. It was dawn by three in the morning and twilight lingered until nine at night. The whole long day was a blaze of sunshine. The ghostly winter silence had given way to the great spring murmur of awakening life. This murmur arose from all the land, filled with the joy of living. It came from the things that lived and moved again, things which had been dead and had not moved during the long months of frost. The sap was rising in the pines. The willow and aspen trees were bursting out in young buds. Shrubs and vines were putting on fresh shades of green. Crickets sang in the nights, and in the days all manner of creeping, crawling things rustled forth into the sun. Partridges and woodpeckers were booming and knocking in the forest. Squirrels were chattering, birds singing, and overhead honked the wild birds flying up from the south. From every hill slope came the trickle of running water, the music of unseen fountains. All things were thawing, bending, snapping. The Yukon was straining to break loose from the ice that bound it down. It ate away from beneath. The sun ate from above. Air holes formed in ice. Fissures sprang and spread apart while thin sections of ice fell through into the river. And through all of this bursting and throbbing of awakening life, under the blazing sun and through the soft sighing breezes, staggered the two men, the woman, and the huskies, like travelers heading toward death. With the dogs falling, Mercedes weeping and riding, Hal swearing, and Charles's eyes watering, they staggered into John Thornton's camp at the mouth of the White River. When they halted, the dogs dropped down as though they had all been struck dead. Mercedes dried her eyes and looked at John Thornton. Charles sat down on a log to rest. He sat down very slowly and painstakingly because of stiffness and soreness. Hal did the talking. John Thornton was whittling the last touches on an axe handle he had made from a stick of birch. He whittled and listened, gave monosyllabic replies, and, when it was asked, terse advice. He knew the kind of people the men were, and he gave his advice knowing that it would not be followed. They told us earlier that the bottom was dropping out of the trail and that the best thing for us to do was wait, Hal said after John Thornton warned him not to take any more chances on the thawing ice. They told us we couldn't make White River. And here we are. The last statement was made with a sneering sound of triumph in it. And they told you true, John Thornton answered. The bottom's likely to drop out at any moment. Only fools with the blind luck of fools could have made it. I tell you straight, I wouldn't risk my carcass on that ice for all the gold in Alaska. That's because you're no fool, I suppose, said Hal. All the same, we'll go on to Dawson. He uncoiled his whip. Get up there, Buck! Hi, get up there! Mush on! Thornton went on whittling. It was useless, he knew, to get between a fool and his folly. But the team did not get up at the command. The whip flashed out mercilessly here and there. John Thornton tightened his lips. Solex was the first to crawl to his feet. Teak followed. Joe came next, yelping with pain. Pike made painful efforts. Twice he fell over, and on the third attempt, managed to rise. Buck made no effort. He lay quietly where he had fallen. The lash bit into him again and again, but he neither whined nor struggled. Several times, Thornton started as though to speak, but changed his mind. A moisture came into his eyes, and as the whipping continued, he arose and paced back and forth. This was the first time Buck had failed and it drove Hal into a rage. He exchanged the whip for a club. Buck refused to move under the rain of heavier blows which now fell upon him. Like his mates, he was barely able to get up, but unlike them, 
he had made up his mind not to get up. He had a feeling of impending doom. He had felt this way from the moment they had left the bank of the river, and he could not get rid of this feeling. He had felt the thin and rotten ice under his feet all day, and he sensed a disaster close at hand out there on the ice where his master was trying to drive him. He refused to get up. He had suffered so greatly, and he was so exhausted that the blows did not hurt much. And as they continued to fall upon him, the spark of life within Buck flickered and dimmed. It was nearly out. He felt strangely numb, as though from a great distance he was aware that he was being beaten. The last sensations of pain left him. He no longer felt anything, though very faintly he could hear the impact of the club upon his body. But it was no longer his body. It seemed so far away. And then suddenly, without warning, uttering a cry that was like the cry of an animal, John Thornton sprang upon the man with the club. Hal was hurled backward as though struck by a falling tree. Mercedes screamed. Charles watched and wiped his watery eyes, but he could not get up because of his pain. John Thornton stood over Buck, struggling to control himself, too filled with rage to speak. If you strike that dog again, I'll kill you he at last managed to say in a choking voice. "'It's my dog,' Hal replied, wiping the blood from his mouth as he came back. "'Get out of my way, or I'll fix you. I'm going to Dawson.' Thornton stood between him and Buck, and showed no intention of getting out of the way. Hal drew his long hunting knife. Mercedes screamed, cried, laughed, and seemed hysterical. Thornton hit Hal's knuckles with the axe handle, knocking the knife to the ground. He hit Hal's knuckles again as he tried to pick it up. Then he stooped, picked the knife up himself, and with two strokes cut Buck's traces. Hal had no fight left in him. Besides, his hands were full with his sister, and Buck was too near dead to be of further use in hauling the sled. A few minutes later, the three pulled out from the bank and down the river. Buck heard them go and raised his head to see. Pike was leading, Solex was at the wheel, and between were Joe and Teak. They were limping and staggering. Mercedes was riding the loaded sled. Hal guided at the G-pole, and Charles stumbled along in the rear. As Buck watched them, Thornton knelt beside him and with rough, kindly hands searched for broken bones. By the time his search had disclosed nothing more than many bruises and a state of terrible starvation, the sled was a quarter of a mile away. Dog and man watched it crawling along over the ice. Suddenly, they saw its back end drop down, and the G-pole, with Hal clinging to it, jerk into the air. Mercedes' scream came to their ears. They saw Charles turn and make one step to run back, and then a whole section of ice fell through and the dogs and humans disappeared. A yawning hole was all that was to be seen. The bottom had dropped out of the trail and taken the sled, the two men, the woman, and the dogs with it. John Thornton and Buck looked at each other. You poor devil, said John Thornton, and Buck licked his hand.